Coming up on this episode of Iowa Live, see how this team of volunteers is rehabilitating wild birds. You know, it's kind of one of the first things we hear is, I've never been this close to a bird. Visit a Marengo barn that now serves as a creative space for filmmakers. Mediaverse Studios is a film collaborative. What we're trying to do here is encourage all of the filmmakers in the Midwest to make their dreams come true. And learn how the Christofferson family prioritizes love and advocacy. We really switched at that time to a new trajectory of just loving every moment, loving every ounce of extra that everybody brings and seeing the beauty in it. It's all coming up next on Iowa Life. Funding for Iowa Life is provided by the Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Mark and Kay DeCook Charitable Foundation, proud to support programs that highlight the stories about the people and places of Iowa. The Strickler Family, in loving memory of Lois Strickler, to support programs that highlight the importance of Iowa's natural resources on Iowa PBS. And by the Laney Grimm Fund for Inclusive Programming at the Iowa PBS Foundation. Every spring and fall, hundreds of millions of birds migrate through Iowa, though we often take them for granted. I don't think people understand how important birds are to our survival. Birds play a huge role in insect um, control, in rodent control. They also are pollinators and seed spreaders. And if we lose our bird population, it's gonna have a direct impact on humans as well. Wild birds are in decline. It's a pretty devastating number. Um, 25 to 30 percent of wild birds have disappeared in the last 50 years. One question I am starting to ask people is like, can you imagine a world without birds? And you know, I think that we take for granted when we walk outside, we hear the birds, we see them. We don't really think about that because they're there and they're always there. But I think if we get to a point where we start losing their population or they disappear completely, it's going to be pretty noticeable. Probably very few people know that, you know, nestled in a yard in Beaverdale area of Des Moines is one of the busiest wildlife centers in the state of Iowa. So we do um, specialize in just wild birds, so we don't take in mammals, but we do take in nearly 2,000 birds a year. Our goal is to take them in, give them medical treatment, medical care, um, rehabilitate them, get them ready for release, and then release them. So this is our pigeon aviary. Um, all of these pigeons have come in through rehabilitation cases. Um, so a lot of them have come in just injured or baby pigeons. A lot of times people find them downtown. I think this one, maybe here, is missing a leg. And he was a, he was a rehab case. His um, leg had been twisted up in some string and then he was hanging from, I think it was a banker's trust sign. Um, and animal control was able to get him down and then we were able to um, amputate his leg because it was pretty mangled and now he, he, he does great. He flies well, he flies around with the other pigeons and then he comes back. We don't mind having them here. Um, some of them might be a little bit more friendly than others. <laughs> I first got involved in bird rehabilitation when I was a graduate student in California. Um, I was at UC Davis studying microbiology and I found a baby crow and I didn't know what to do with it. So I called one of my professors and he said, bring in a can of cat food and I'll show you how to feed it. 
I did everything wrong. I, um, it's actually illegal to raise um, a federally protected bird, which a crow is, and I, um, he imprinted on me. So there's a lot of things that just, you know, were not, not done well. But after that, I decided if I want to rehabilitate birds, then I want to do it correctly. In 2012, I got my own permit to rehabilitate wild birds and started keeping track of our numbers. And that year I took in 170 birds, and this last year we took in almost 2,000 birds. It definitely was not anywhere I imagined myself when I was in grad school. Um, I loved science and I loved research, but once I started working with birds, um, something just blossomed, and I, I'm not sure if I can even tell you what that is. It was just that these guys are remarkable and they're beautiful. And I think what I love about working with wildlife is that it's not a permanent thing. I am trying to get this bird back out into the wild as soon as I can. So this little guy has a, a wing injury that he's recovering from. The nighthawks get hit by cars a lot. They hunt at dusk when the insects are most prevalent. Some of them just came in as babies, um, but they weren't quite ready to go. They weren't strong enough to go in the fall. So we were trying to overwinter them, but they are a tougher bird to, to rehab. It's a lot of fun, it's diverse. Um, one reason I went into science is because I you know, wanted a job where it changed all the time, and that's kind of what rehabilitation is with wild birds too. Our day-to-day -day is never the same. We work with a vet when we need to, so if we need to get x-rays or special medication, we have a vet that we can work with. But a lot of the medical is done by me and just through my experience. So I can set legs, I can set wings, um, we can give medication if the bird um, has an infection. So this is Jujubee. She is a turkey vulture, and she is one of our education birds. Um, she's about two years old now. She came to us when she was probably about four or five months old. Um, she had wing deformities, so her wings can't extend fully. They kind of bend in them. And um, when she arrived, she also had really horrible feather uh, damage, which indicated to me that somebody had kept her in a cage for a while. So she can't fly. Um, but she is going to be a great education ambassador for us. It's a great way for people to see a bird up close and personal. We get to talk about Jujube in particular as a turkey vulture being um, a scavenger. Without turkey vultures, um, our roads would just be a mess. So they are a kind of a cleanup crew. Everybody who seems to meet her loves her, and I think that turkey vultures get a really bad rap. People love being close up to birds. Mm -hmm. You know, it's kind of one of the first things we hear is, I've never been this close to a bird. We are not just taking in birds from the metro area anymore, we're taking them in from all over the state. So we're definitely at a point where we're, we need more space. I think that Iowa is ready for a wildlife center specifically for birds, and that's kind of our, our next goal, um, is to build a facility that is permanent uh, that can handle the number of birds that we take in, and it can also handle the variety of birds that we take in. It goes beyond just you know saving this one bird. I think that we are one small place in Iowa, and I believe in the ripple effect. Letting nature take its course, you know, maybe in some instances that's sometimes what we have to do, but we have the knowledge and we have the experience and we have the know-how to help a bird with whatever it's going through, then why not? And why not give it that second chance? So we are here at Mediaverse Studios and this is in Marengo, Iowa, west of Iowa City. Mediaverse Studios is a film collaborative. What we're trying to do here is encourage all of the filmmakers in the Midwest to make their dreams come true. So we're sitting right now on six acres. With any luck, we'll be able to turn this into an entire film compound. We would like this place to just become a hub for all filmmakers in the Midwest, to be honest. Um, something that can be inspiring and can be just immensely useful. Everybody settle and action. Filmmaking in Iowa, if you're really out there alone with, you don't know where to start, it definitely is a grind. Like you just have to get a camera and you have to make things. 
school. I didn't go to film school. I didn't know that people were doing it here. It definitely took meeting people who also have the same passion, specifically my partner, Michael Huntington, to get me into it. I started filmmaking probably when I was like 10. I really got into it. My dad showed me movies and I fell in love with storytelling. We had a, a handheld camera that I found in a closet and we just started making uh, short films with that. But when I started, I, I knew nothing. And action. There are people doing all levels of it in Iowa. It's huge, you know? There's, there's a ton of people here that love filmmaking and are passionate about it no matter what level they're at, if they're like being paid professionally or uh, just grinding independently. It, you're missing the point. She's taking So I got into filmmaking during COVID. I think that a lot of people uh, found a creative outlet while they were stuck at home and mine just happened to be filmmaking. So I made a couple of short films with, uh, with my partner at home and we had a great time doing it. I found that I really loved this craft and I got onto the Iowa Film Facebook page and just happened to break into a pocket of local filmmakers. And that happened to be Michael and Brittany. Three years ago, we were doing our third annual Christmas film. And that's where we met Jake Daniels. Our sound person dropped out for a short film we were gonna do, and I was like, I know this guy. I'll hit him up to do sound. And um, he just kept coming back, and we would do projects after projects. And we were outside one night, and I was talking about the filmmaking idea. I'm like, man, I wish I had a studio, you know? And Jake was like, well, my parents have a place. And I'm like, what? And then he showed me photos, and it was this massive facility. And I'm like, dude, this is crazy. So I grew up in Ladora, uh, probably about 10 minutes west of here. And uh, I went to Iowa Valley High School here in Marengo. And this building is actually owned by my father. Uh, he ran Iowa Valley Vet Clinic out of here, and then uh, it was Honey Creek Marketplace for a couple of years. And then when COVID hit, they had to shut down. The use of this space is just very convenient, and uh, we're very grateful to, to my family for allowing us to rent it from them. I'll never forget that moment going through those gates. There was things there that you could see a future in. Film Alley is a set of stalls that can turn into film sets. Uh, you can control all the lighting, you can uh, control the set design and tailor to you whatever the film needs. That's the biggest thing. Um, when people want to write stories that involve a hospital room, the chances of getting into a hospital room is minimal. In a place like this, we can build one as we've done, and it's already been utilized in a short film. So just the ability to create what you want in your film, as opposed to being limited to what you can obtain. Adjacent to that, we have our podcast setup. We have a dedicated editing room. We have our own equipment, and we are able to rent it out a movie theater and a wardrobe and prop department, all of that stuff. And it has been a lot of work, but it's been uh, very successful so far. Coincidentally, we were filming in Marengo far before we even knew this building existed. And I think what really drew us in is that it is a small community and we have found it to be great to film in. Now that they know we're here, there is kind of more of a, an awareness and an acceptance of us filming out there. And it's been a really great experience. We have a crew right now of 13 people. We have auto mechanics, we have construction workers, we have graphic designers. We're all filmmakers and so we all have ideas. There's like 13 of us who all have the same passion, but the ultimate goal is for the community to get in here and use this space. One of my favorite memories here was we did the July 3rd parade here in Marengo, and then we all pulled our float back in here uh, after the sun went down. They started shooting off fireworks and we all just kind of sat on the parade float and watched the fireworks. And Without filmmaking, we would never even know each other. That's, that's what this is. This is building family. It's more than just film. It's more than just art and creativity. It's family. Matt and I have been married, uh, it'll be 25 years this summer, and we have eight children. Kat is the oldest at 22, Gabe is 20, Karsten is 17, Bo is 16, almost 16, and Elle is 15, Griffin's 14, May is 12, and Eve is 10. Did I get them all? You got them all. <laughs> you did much better than I would have done. 
We're kind of like a, a beehive. While there's a lot going on, we generally buzz in the same direction. Oh, pretty much. We try to really focus on each other's strengths and rally around each other. We say we put each other in the love jar, so focusing on the positive of each other. That's perfect, big boy. So Karsten loves the family. His hero is Gabe. Gabe is his best friend. Did you enjoy bowling today, buddy? Yes. You got a spare, didn't you, at the beginning? Yes. Good job, bud. Good spare. We're brothers. We are brothers, yeah. I was born in 2006. You were born in 2006. How about you? Do you know when I was born? No. 2003. Oh. Bo, May, L, L, May. <laughs> and cat. This is little boy from I was from father from born in China. Yeah, we have five siblings who are adopted. I think anybody who has younger siblings will like relate to wanting to be there for them and like do right by them and protect them. Karsten is now 17, so about 10 hours after he was born, my hospital room fills full of uh, doctors to tell us that they believe he has Down syndrome. I say Karsten rearranged my stars, so he changed everything. And we really switched at that time to a new trajectory of just loving every moment, loving every ounce of extra that everybody brings and seeing the beauty in it. And also started my journey in advocacy around children with special needs. He's been dark. Karsten just wants to be included, involved. He wants his opinions known. He wants to be sure you know about him. He is just really good too at reading a room and knowing who needs him. It's just kind of incredible how he picks up on those things. Well, and I think one of the nice things about Karsten, too, is he focuses on what he thinks is important. You know, all of the other things that sometimes we get caught up in and get worried about, he just lets those go. Over Christmas, Kat and Gabe were back from college. We had him home for a whole month, so all eight little birdies were back in the nest. And we did our annual gingerbread contest during that time. When Kat and I were, were doing the gingerbread house, I came up with ideas and she put them on the house. That teamwork together made us win. So always remember to work as a team. So Griffin is amazing. When he was little, I would call his name and, and he wouldn't respond to his name. And that kind of set the wheels in motion. We got one diagnosis of mixed expressive receptive speech delays at that time. But when he was nine, we got the official diagnosis that he is on the autism spectrum. We were already plugged into the services that we needed to be plugged into. I also think that that places like ChildServe have really enabled our family to be the family we are because we're not having to hunt and peck for all of these different services. It's all under one roof. There's Bishop here, you can't take it. <laughs> we felt really lucky that we found Johnston Community Education in the chess club and he really enjoys going to that and being a part of the club. <laughs> he likes to win. He does like to, a quiet win. Griffin will bring the energy to the room. It's, it's just Griffin, and it's, it's fun. He keeps you on your toes. He's a fun kid. He's a great kid. I just, his sense of humor is hilarious. He's very logical. He, he's the keeper of insane amount of knowledge. What's your favorite part of your Usu days? Usually like right then, like what yeah, right now. Yeah, right now. Eating food, a family. Yeah. Being around my friends, yeah. I've learned like to be more patient and be more inclusive with the others and like to just be nice. Just because you're a little different 
doesn't mean that we're all not the same. We're all the same. Some of us are just a little different. <laughs> Bo came popping into our lives when he was six. And I like to say that Bo is a lover, not a fighter. He and Karsten, while they share a diagnosis of Down syndrome, are quite different on their personalities. Very different personalities, but very, very fun people to be around. Karsten is a little more discerning on who he wants to spend his time with. <laughs> Bo wants to spend time with anybody that he can wrap his arms around. He loves Sparkle Squad and cheering with the cheerleaders. What's up, dude? What's up? He loves beatboxing for us. That's his primary joy in life. Yeah, he's the showman. Yeah, I love pie. You love pie. Pie. I'm made tacos. Made tacos. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Mhm. A few days ago, yeah. Mhm. They were a bit yeah. spicy. I think but... most importantly, yeah. like as a family, we are able to like have fun as a family. Mm -hmm. That's family is also fun. Family is love. Those are I think that's what family should be. Right, Bubba? We have fun. Yeah, kitty. Yeah, kitty. <laughs> he calls me kitty sometimes. I don't know. We just fit together really well. Everybody's got their personalities and what they're good at. Yeah. And they just. They just, you know, use whatever they're good at and then help each other out. It's like a little bit of everything. We complement each other really well. Like everyone brings everything to the table and everyone is just like amazing. And it just brings this whole family together. Like no one is left out. Everyone is here and important. Ellen, um, what's the best part of your day? Um, I'm hoping that Matt and I have lived our lives and demonstrated to our kids the importance of being the voice for others and just create a better, brighter place for everyone to live.
Funding for Iowa Life is provided by the Gilchrist Foundation, founded by Jocelyn Gilchrist, furthering the philanthropic interests of the Gilchrist family in wildlife and conservation, the arts and public broadcasting, and disaster relief. Mark and Kay DeCook Charitable Foundation, proud to support programs that highlight the stories about the people and places of Iowa. The Strickler Family, in loving memory of Lois Strickler, to support programs that highlight the importance of Iowa's natural resources on Iowa PBS, and by the Laney Grimm Fund for Inclusive Programming at the Iowa PBS Foundation.